Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity of being here today to study this magnificent book of Job. We ask, Father, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us clarity of thought and give, it, give us willingness of heart to receive the word that you will plant. And we ask this in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. In our last study together, we analyzed the story of this great patriarch, Job. And today in part two, we want to study the story of Job from a different perspective. We want to look at the messianic meaning of the book of Job. Because the book of Job really is not only about Job. It's first of all about Job, secondly about Jesus, and in the third place about what will happen to God's people when they go through the end time tribulation. Now what I'm saying is that the book of Job is actually a type of what would happen with Jesus, a type of Christ. Now we need to understand that a type is never as perfect as the fulfillment or the anti-type. In other words, Job is a sinful human being who becomes an illustration of the experience that Jesus would go through. Now there are other types of Jesus in the Old Testament as well. You know, we have David, Joseph, and other individuals in the Old Testament that prefigured what Jesus would do in his lifetime. And Job uh, is no exception to this rule that the Old Testament characters are types or illustrations of Jesus Christ. In other words, Job foreshadows the experience of Jesus who would come uh, about 2,000 years after this story transpired. Now something that we need to remember about the first study that we had together and that is that the entire heavenly council is observing what is taking place in the story of Job. In other words, this story is transpiring in, uh, on earth, but it's being seen or it's being witnessed in heaven because God is trying to prove a very important point. We also noticed in our last study that Satan was the culprit working behind the scenes. Job did not understand this, but the story is very clear that all of the calamities that Job suffered came to him as a result of the work of Satan behind the scenes. In other words, it was Satan who unleashed all of the powers of hell against this man. And as we noticed in the first study on Job, the purpose of Satan's work was to lead Job to let go of his relationship with God. In other words, it was to prove before the universe that Job served God not because he loved God, but because of everything that God did for him. Because God helped him and God prospered him. So we're going to take a look at the story of Job from the perspective of the Messiah. In other words, we're going to draw a parallel between this Old Testament patriarch and the experience of Jesus Christ. The first point that I would like us to notice is the moral uprightness of Job. We're told in Job chapter 1 and verse 8 the following about this great patriarch. And by the way, these are the words of the Lord. It says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Notice the description. He was blameless upright, he feared God, and he shunned evil. In other words, he had a sterling moral character. Now Jesus also had a sterling uh, character, moral character. We find in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 a description of that character of Jesus. We're told there in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. 
Notice the description of the character of Jesus, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Very similar to the description that we find in Job chapter 1 and verse 8 and which is repeated also in Job chapter 2, the first couple of verses. Another parallel that we notice between Job and Jesus is the fact that Job was a very rich man. In fact he was the richest man in all of the East according to Job chapter 1. And of course we all know that Jesus was the owner of the universe. And we also know that Job lost all of his riches. And Jesus also gave up all of his riches. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 speaks about the riches of Jesus and how Jesus gave up those riches to come to this world. We're told there by the Apostle Paul, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. So very clearly the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus was rich, but Jesus became poor. And according to Scripture He not only became poor, He became the poorest of the poor. He took the place of a servant and He, he even humbled Himself more than a servant, dying the death of a cross. Another interesting parallel that we notice between Job and Jesus is the fact that both of them lost the support of their own family. Their own family did not understand the experience that they were going through. Notice Job chapter 19 and verses 13 through 15. Job chapter 19 and verses 13 through 15 speaking about Job we find these words. Speaking about God, He has removed my brothers far from me and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed, and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight." In other words, forsaken by his own family, misunderstood by his relatives and by his acquaintances. Now we find several instances in the Gospels that Jesus was also misunderstood. We have for example in Mark chapter 13 uh, the mother of Jesus and his brothers come because they want to take Jesus home because they feel that Jesus is going to have a nervous breakdown. Obviously they don't understand His mission. And in fact in John chapter 7 and verse 5 we find this very telling short statement. John says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Even his brothers did not believe in him, just as happened with the patriarch Job. Another interesting parallel is that Job was not only forsaken by his relatives and his family, he was also forsaken by his friends. Notice Job chapter 19, and I'm going to read verse 19 and verses 21 and 22. Job 19 verse 19 and then verses 21 and 22. Here Job is speaking and he says, All my close friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. Verse 21, have pity on me, have pity on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does, and are not satisfied with my flesh? So we find in this passage that Job is actually persecuted by his own friends. He's forsaken by his friends, not only by his family. Now it's interesting to notice that Job was especially forsaken by three very close friends. You can find that at the end of chapter 2. Now we find in the New Testament that Jesus also had three very close friends among the disciples. They were called Peter, James, and John. Notice Mark chapter 14 and verse 33 and then we're going to read verse 50. 
Mark 14 verse 33 and then we'll read verse 50. It says here, And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Notice that he took three disciples to be with him in his greatest sufferings in the Garden of Gethsemane. A little bit later on in verse 50 we find that these three close friends as well as the other disciples forsook him. In fact it says in verse 50, then they all forsook him and fled. It's interesting also to notice that Job even though God said that he was blameless and upright and he feared God and he rejected evil, he was accused by his enemies as being a great sinner. Notice the words of Eliphaz to Job in chapter 22 and verses 4 and 5. Job 22 and verses 4 and 5. Here Eliphaz says to Job, Is it because of your fear of him that he reproves you and enters into judgment with you? In other words, is it really because you fear God that all of these things are happening to you? Notice verse 5. Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? In other words, it's not because you fear God, it's because you are iniquitous that these things, these calamities are falling upon you. Do you know that this is the very accusation that was made against Jesus when He hung on the cross by His enemies? They said, if this man was of God, He wouldn't be going through all of these sufferings that He's going through now. In fact, allow me to read you a passage that we find in the Desire of Ages, pages 60 and 61. Once again, the Desire of Ages, pages 60 and 61, this uh, magnificent biography of Jesus written by Ellen White. Notice what she says, Satanic agencies confederated with evil men in leading the people to believe Christ the chief of sinners and to make him the object of detestation. Detestation means somebody to be rejected, somebody to be refused. So notice, satanic agencies confederated with evil men, just like in the story of Job, in leading the people to believe Christ the chief of sinners and to make him the object of detestation. She continues saying, those who mocked Christ as he hung upon the cross were imbued with the spirit of the first great rebel. He filled them with vile and loathsome speeches. He inspired their taunts. So notice that the enemies, uh, the enemies of Jesus taunted Him. The enemies of Jesus filled their, ar their, their mouths with satanic arguments, just like happened with the friends of Job and with the enemies of Job. Another interesting parallel between Job and Jesus is the fact that both of them were physically disfigured. Notice for example the description that is given of Job in Job chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8. Job chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8. It says there, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd, that is a piece of pottery, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Very interesting here that Job had to scratch himself with a potsherd. And we find a little bit later in the story that when the, the three friends of Job come to visit him to, to comfort him, they actually don't recognize him because he's so physically disfigured according to the last couple of verses of Job chapter 2. Now what about Jesus? Notice Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14 on the physical uh, aspects of Jesus. It says in Isaiah 52 and verse 14, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. Notice that the visage of Jesus was marred more than any man. This is a messianic prophecy. It says, and his form more than the sons of men. So this text indicates that Jesus was actually disfigured 
in his sufferings in this earth. Notice Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2 speaking once again about the Messiah. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. So clearly the book of Isaiah indicates that the Messiah was not going to be physically attractive, in fact in his sufferings he was going to be disfigured. Another interesting parallel between Job and Jesus is the fact that both of them were mocked by the multitudes. They were mocked by the nations. We notice first of all that the family forsook Job. Then we notice also that his friends forsook him and did not understand him. But also the surrounding nations, the multitudes scorned Job. Notice chapter 16 and verses 9 through 11. Job 16 verses 9 through 11. He's speaking about what he appears to think that God is doing to him. He tears me in his wrath and hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. My adversary sharpens his gaze on me. And then he goes to the plural. They gape at me with their mouth. They strike me reproachfully on the cheek. I want you to remember these things. They gape at him with, it, with their mouth. They strike him reproachfully on the cheek. They gather to, together against me. God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. You know the description which is given of Jesus while he was on the cross is very similar. Notice Matthew 27 and verses 28 to 31. Matthew chapter 27 and verses 28 to 31. It says, And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him. Notice the idea of mockery with Jesus also. And mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. We just read a few moments ago that Job was struck on his face. Verse 31, And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Another very interesting parallel between Job and Jesus is the fact that both of them were spit upon. Notice Job chapter 17 and verse 6. Job 17 and verse 6. It says there, but he, speaking about God, what God, he perceives God to be doing with him, but he has made me a byword of the people, and I have become one in whose face men spit. Notice also Job chapter 30 and verses 9 to 13. The same idea of the surrounding peoples spitting in his face. Job 30 and beginning with verse 9. And now I am their taunting song. Yes, I am their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. Because he has loosed my bowstring and bowstring and afflicted me. They have cast off restraint before me. In other words, there's no restraint for these people that are abusing Job. Verse 12, at my right hand the rabble arises, they push away my feet, and they raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path, they promote my calamity, they have no helper. Now notice what happened to Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 and verses 67 and 68. Job 26, excuse me, Matthew 26 and verses 67 and 68. Very similar to the experience of Job. It says there, then they spat in his face, that is in the face of Jesus, and beat him. And others struck him. We already read this about Job. Struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us Christ. Who is the one who struck you? His crown and glory were torn away. In fact, let's go to our next point. 
Job 19 and verse 9 speaks about the glory of Jesus being removed from him and his crown being removed from him as happened with Job. Let's read first of all about Job and then we'll read a statement about Jesus. Job 19 and we'll read actually verses 9 through 11. Speaking about God, once again, Job is perceiving that God is doing this to him. He has stripped me of my glory. Notice, he's saying, God stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. My hope, he has uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me. Notice that he's feeling the wrath of God against him. And he counts me as one of his enemies. In a very interesting statement that we find in the Desire of Ages, pages 22 and 23, we find that Jesus also left aside his throne and his glory to come to this world. It says there in Desire of Ages, pages 22 and 23, speaking about Jesus, he might have retained the glory of heaven and the homage of the angels, but he chose to give back the scepter, that's what a king has, the scepter into the hands, of, into his father's hands, and to step down from the throne of the universe. In other words, he set aside his glory and he set aside his crown, just as happened with Job. Another interesting detail about Job is that evidently after a period of suffering his body was, uh, actually his bones could be seen through his skin. He was suffering so terribly. Notice Job chapter 19 and verse 20. Job chapter 19 and verse 20. Here Job says, My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. In other words, he's just barely hanging on to life according to this. And all of his bones can be seen. Notice the very interesting messianic prophecy in Psalm 22 and verse 17, which is referring to Jesus. The whole Psalm 22 is a reference to Christ. Jesus is speaking here and he says, I can count all my bones. See, his bones could be seen through his flesh. They look at me and stare at me. Now another interesting parallel between Job and Jesus is the fact that both of them cried out to God for answers, but in both cases God was silent and God did not answer their pleas immediately. Notice Job 16 and verses 12 and 13. Job 16 and verses 12 and 13. Job once again is describing his experience and he can't understand, of course, what's happening. He, he, he wonders why God has turned against him. And he says this, I was at ease, but he has shattered me, speaking about God. He also has taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces. He has set, up, set me up for his target. His archers surround me. He pierces my heart and does not pity. He pours out my gall on the ground. That's an important detail. He pours out my gall on the ground. You remember that gall was given to Jesus. It says, you have become cruel to me and do not hear me. So he's suffering this terribly cruel experience. He's crying out to God and God does not immediately answer his pleas. It appears like even God has forsaken him. Notice Job 30 verses 20 and 21. The same idea of Job crying out and God not answering him. It says there in Job 30 verse 20, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up and you regard me, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your hand you oppose me. Both Job and Jesus were men of sorrows acquainted with grief. In fact, notice Job 16, verses 16 and 17, that Job actually shed uh, an abundance of tears as he was going through his sufferings. He was a man of sorrow. He was filled with grief. Notice Job 16, verses 16 and 17. Job says, My face is flushed from weeping, and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. 
And then he says, although no violence is in my hands and my prayer is pure. In other words, this is not happening to me because I'm a big sinner, because I deserve what is taking place. There's no violence in my hands. My prayer is pure and my face is flushed with weeping and my eyelids uh, are, and my eyelids are the shadow of death. Notice that Jesus went through the same experience. Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Once again, this is a messianic prophecy. Speaking about Jesus, it says, He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Notice the idea of sorrow and grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. We've already noticed that Job felt forsaken by God. Every earthly support was removed. In other words, not only did Job lose all of his possessions, he also, for all practical purposes, lost the support of his family, he lost the support of his friends, he lost his physical health, and now it appeared that even God had forsaken him. The same is true of Jesus. When he hung on the cross, he had nothing in this world to lean upon. Notice Job 31 and verse 35. Job 31 and verse 35. Here Job it wishes that there would be one in heaven who would listen to him. He says this, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me that my prosecutor had written a book. In other words, I, I wish that God would answer me when I cry out. Notice Psalm 69 verses 20 and 21. It's speaking here about Jesus and the fact that Jesus also had no one to listen to Him. He had no one to answer His pleas. It says there in Psalm 69 and verse 20, Reproach has broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food. Remember we noticed that in the story of Job? They gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Both of these men apparently were forsaken by everyone. They lost everything. And it appeared that even God had turned against them. Notice in the case of Jesus, Matthew 27 and verse 46, the words that Jesus speaks to His Father while He's hanging on the cross. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. This is uh, slightly before Jesus dies on the cross of Calvary. It says there, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Job and Jesus had basically the same prayer. They felt forsaken by everyone, including God Himself. And they were going through suffering without any apparent reason at all. Notice Desire of Ages, page 753. Desire of Ages, 753, about these terrible sufferings of Jesus where he, he actually sheds these tears and he suffers alone. It says there, But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. See, Jesus could not see his Father's face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in, in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. You know, you read the story of Job, you don't find Job complaining about his physical suffering. You don't say, oh, uh, you know, I have this terrible disease. You know, I have to scratch myself with a potsherd and I'm bleeding and everything is so painful. You never hear Job complaining about his physical pain. Because his spiritual anguish is so great because his friend apparently has turned against him. His family, all of his friends, the multitudes have turned against him and he can't understand why this is happening. And with Jesus, the same transpired. 
Notice another statement, Desire of Ages, page 753, same page, different statement. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. And meanwhile, Satan is saying to Jesus, as he said to Job, it's because you're bearing all of these sins that this is happening to you, and if you go forward with it, you're going to be separated from your Father forever. The difference is that Jesus was actually bearing the sins of the whole world upon Himself. And the devil was saying to Him, it's because of those sins that you're suffering this and you're never going to see your Father's face again. In the story of Job in the Old Testament, the devil also accused Job of being a great sinner, but Job said, you can look at my life, and in my life I have consecrated myself totally to the Lord, I fear Him, and I reject evil. And the devil whispers to Jesus, you know, how can you trust a God that treats you this way? If God really loved you, do you think that God would leave you suffering on the cross like this? He says, sin is so great that you're going to be eternally separated from your Father. Notice Job chapter 13 verses 23 and 24. How, how Job feels this anguish because he looks for sins and he can't find sins in his life that would justify the experience that he's going through. Job 13 verses 23 and 24. Here Job says, How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? In other words, he's saying, show me my sins. In fact, at the beginning of the story of Job, we find that God Himself said that Job was a man who feared God. He rejected evil. He was blameless. And he was upright. In other words, God Himself confessed that, that Job was a righteous man. And yet Job says, show me my iniquities, which would justify what is happening to me now. You know, with Job, as I mentioned with Jesus, his uh, physical sufferings were secondary to his deep spiritual anguish. In fact, allow me to read you from Job 9 verses 32 and 33, and then I'm going to read you a passage from Desire of Ages. Job 9, 32 and 33. For he is not a man, as I am, Job is speaking about God, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Nor is there, now notice this, any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. In other words, Job here is pleading for a mediator. He wants somebody to stand between him and God. And yet there is no one that mediates between God and himself. Notice Desire of Ages, page 686, speaking about Jesus. It says, as the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto he had been an intercessor for others. Now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. So just like Job, Jesus longed to have an intercessor with his father because he knew that if he could present his case before his father, his father would see things as he did. And yet the answer of God was silence. Now you remember in our first study that Job had these moments where he was deep in the valley and then he would come up to the mountaintop. In other words, his faith would rise and, and he would say, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that the, at the end of the days God is going to resurrect me and in this flesh of mine I'm going to see God. The fact is, Job 13 verse 15, Job in one of his higher moments says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Do you know Jesus had the same experience? Immediately after Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
the next very words that he spoke expressed faith and confidence in his father. In one breath he's crying out to his father, Father, I feel that you've forsaken me. But in the next breath he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. That's Luke 23 and verse 46. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. In other words, Jesus and Job even though they were going through this intense experience, refused to let go of the hand of God. Notice Job 27 and verses 4 uh, through 6. Job 27 verses 4 through 6. Here we find that Job refuses to release the hand of God, even though the devil is telling him, it's because of all of your sins that this is happening to you. How can you trust a God that does this to you? How can you love a God that allows you to suffer in this way? And the devil is trying to break his confidence in God. Job hangs on for dear life to his relationship with God. Notice Job 27 and verse 4. Job says, my lips will not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die I will not put away my integrity from me. Notice he says, till I die I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. You know, Job realized that his experience was actually a refining experience that was going to benefit him in his future life. Notice Job 23 and verses 8 through 10. Job 23 and verses 8 through 10. Here Job understands that the experience that he's going through is a refining experience that is actually going to make his character come forth from the furnace as pure gold. He says there, look, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. See, I can't find God anywhere. Verse, verse uh, 9. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But then notice verse 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I know that this is a good experience for the refinement of my character. By the way, do you know that Jesus also went through suffering to prepare His character so that He could serve as our mediator in the heavenly courts? It was also a refining experience for Christ. Notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 7 through 10. Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 7 to 10. It's speaking about the sufferings of Jesus. And it says, who in the days of his flesh, that is while he was on this earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, see the experience of Job there, and tears to him who was able to save him from death was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. doesn't mean that Jesus was disobedient. It means that he grew ever more in obedience. And so it says, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, that means refined, having his character been set once and for all, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now it's interesting also to notice that Job seeks for sin in his life and he cannot find any sin in his life. Notice Job 31 verses 5 and 6. Job 31 verses 5 and 6. Here Job says, If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. In other words, he says, I'm willing to have God weigh me on his scales and he's going to see that I have integrity, that there is no sin in my life which would bring this about that I'm suffering. By the way, in Desire of Ages, page 761, we find that Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was also sinless. Notice 
Desire of Ages, page 761. Of course, he was sinless in his own character, but he was bearing the sins of the world. Ellen White says this, Could one sin have been found in Christ had he in one particular yielded to Satan to escape the terrible torture, the enemy of God and man would have triumphed. Christ bowed his head and died, but he held fast his faith and his submission to God. Not one sin could be found in Jesus other than the sins that he was bearing for the world. In other words, both Job and Jesus lost every earthly support. The devil tried to shake their confidence and their relationship with God the Father, but the devil could not do it with Job, and the devil could not do it with Jesus. By the way, do you know that in the experience of Job, the vile character of Satan was revealed before the whole universe? We notice in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 that this experience is taking place in the presence of the heavenly council. In other words, God is saying to the heavenly council, look at Job. And he's saying to the devil, take everything he has, take his health, only don't kill him, and you'll notice that he's going to continue serving me because he loves me even if calamities come. God the Father said the same about Jesus before the heavenly beings. I'm going to send him to the world. You can do your utmost to tempt him. You can do your utmost to make him suffer. You can take everything from him and you will see that he will be faithful to me. In fact, allow me to read you a very significant passage, Desire of Ages, page 761, about the sufferings of Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 761. Speaking about the death of Jesus on the cross and the way that the devil made him suffer, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accuse Christ's brethren of being clothed with garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of symph sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. In other words, the story of Job was given in the Old Testament to show the heavenly intelligences what was going to happen when Jesus would come to this world. In fact, I have no doubts whatsoever that as Jesus was going through His experience, the people in heaven, the beings in heaven, were remembering the experience of Job, and they were saying, this experience of Jesus is taking place on a much larger scale than the experience of Job. The experience of Job, in other words, illustrated the experience through which Jesus went. Now there are two senses in which Jesus exceeded the experience of Job. You remember that I mentioned that we're dealing with typology here. Job is the type and Jesus is the anti-type. Job is the shadow and Jesus is the substance or the reality. You know the shadow is never identical to the substance. In other words, the type is never as great as the anti-type. In other words, Job is a small scale model of the experience that Jesus would go through. There are two senses in which Jesus exceeded Job. First of all, Job was not allowed to die. Jesus did die. And secondly, Job was not bearing upon himself the sins of the world. In other words, Job was innocent, and yet he was suffering. Jesus was innocent, but he was bearing upon himself the sins of the whole world. And that is what led to the sufferings of Jesus. So in other words, Jesus was far greater than Job. His sufferings were greater because he was bearing sin. The devil hated Jesus all the more than he hated Job. Now what was the secret of the victory of Jesus in his trials here on earth? Well, it was the same secret that Job uh, had when he overcame the devil 
as the devil came and put him through all of this suffering. You know, Job was close to God in times of prosperity. We noticed in our study last time that Job kept his integrity when things went well. He was a family man. He offered the sacrifices for each of his children on a regular basis. Daily, the Bible says. In fact, Job himself says, in times of prosperity, I was clothing to the naked, I was eyes to the blind, I was a blessing of giving necessary things to the poor. In other words, I used all of my riches to benefit humanity. We noticed that in our last study. In other words, Job had a very strong relationship with God in times of prosperity. And because he had this strong grasp on God in times of prosperity, when times of adversity and difficulty came, he could lean on the experience which he had developed previously with God. Now I want to read you a passage in Desire of Ages, page 756, where uh, Ellen White describes the secret of the victory of Jesus. Once again, the Desire of Ages, page 756. Speaking about Jesus as He hangs on the cross, amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, not really forsaken of God, because Job wasn't forsaken of God either, it just appeared that way. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, He had relied, notice this, in those dreadful hours, He had relied upon the evidence of His Father's acceptance heretofore given Him. In other words, the evidences of His Father's presence up till this point in His previous experience. She continues saying, He was acquainted with the character of His Father. He understood His justice, His mercy, and His great love. By faith, He rested in Him, whom it had ever been His joy to obey. Do you see that His past experience colored the sufferings that He went through? Once again, by faith, He rested in Him, whom it had ever been His joy to obey. And as in submission, He committed Himself to God, the sense of the loss of His Father's of favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was the victor. Now do you remember in the experience of Job that after he went through these terrible trials and tribulations, that at the end of the book appears the individual who caused all of the sufferings of Job? At the beginning of the book, his enemy is called Satan. At the end of the book, Satan is no longer referred to with that, that name. He is called what? He is called Leviathan. And God asks Job, He says, Job, are you able to fish Leviathan out of the sea and to cut him in pieces or to take him as your servant? Of course, Job would have understood immediately when God spoke of Leviathan that this was the enemy of God. Because in that cultural context, it's been discovered archaeologically that there, was a, that, that there was a creature called Leviathan or Lotan who had several heads who was considered to be the enemy of the gods. And so suddenly it, it dawns on Job. He says, oh, it's, it's Leviathan who is doing this to me. And, and then after God shows him this portrait of Leviathan, Job says, now I know that you can do all things. You can even defeat Leviathan. You can even defeat the devil. By the way, do you know that we're told in Scripture that Jesus is going to defeat Leviathan? He's going to defeat the devil and destroy him? Notice in the book of Revelation, if you go with me to Revelation, let's read first of all in chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, and uh, we're going to read about this multi-headed creature. Revelation chapter 12, and notice verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, 
and his angels were cast out with him. Now this casting out that is spoken of here is the fact that the devil before Jesus died on the cross could go to the heavenly courts representing this world. But after Jesus died on the cross he was cast out of heaven as the representative of this world. Now notice the names that he's given. He's called the great dragon, he's called the serpent of old, and he's called Satan. Do you know it's very interesting, we noticed in our last study in Isaiah chapter 27 that Leviathan is called the dragon and he is called the serpent. So you put it together, the dragon, Leviathan, the serpent, Satan, mentioned in the book of Job, make reference to Satan, the enemy of Job and the enemy of God. Now the question is, what is going to be the end of this uh, being who is called the devil, Satan, the dragon, and the serpent? Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verses 7 and following. Revelation 20 verses 7 and following. Now when the thousand years have expired Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and what? and devoured them. In other words Satan, his angels, and all of the wicked people who oppressed Jesus and the devil who oppressed Job eventually is going to be destroyed by the Lord Himself. Just like He prophesied in Job chapter 41. And then you remember in the story of Job that Job received a double amount of the blessings that he enjoy, had enjoyed before his trials. And of course the book of Revelation says that God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And those who have been oppressed by the devil, Jesus Himself who went through these severe trials is going to sit on the throne of God and He's going to reign on this earth forever and ever among His people. And so the story of Job will have reached its fullest fulfillment at the end of the millennium. Now there's one further dimension of the book of Job which I'm going to mention only in passing. And that is that the experience of Job also is an illustration of what's going to happen to God's people during the great final tribulation in the history of this world. There are many texts in the Bible, I'll only mention the concept, uh, perhaps those who are watching this now will be encouraged to go to scripture and look for the final fulfillment of this story of Job. But the Bible tells us that in the end time God's people are going to lose the support of their family. They're going to lose the support of their friends. You can read it there in Matthew 24, in, in Mark 13, in Luke 21, they're going to lose the support of friends. The nations are going to arise against them. And they're going to go through a severe time of tribulation such as the world has never seen. They're going to lose everything that they have. They're going to lose houses, they're going to lose automobiles, they're going to lose the money in the bank, they're going to lose every single earthly support on planet earth. And when they go through this severe time of trouble it's going to even appear that God has forsaken them on this earth. In fact the story of the widow in Luke chapter 18 where it says that this widow kept on coming and coming and coming to the judge so that the judge would do justice against her adversary. The adversary of course here is the devil. And finally the judge says I'm going to do justice to her. The same is going to happen during the time of trouble. God's people will cry out day and night. They will plead with the Lord to deliver them from the hands of their enemies who are being used by the devil to persecute God's people. And yet for a while at least, God will keep His silence. But just like in the book of Job where God after chapter 37 now is revealed in a great theophany, in other words He's revealed in creation at the end of time. God is going to be revealed in the midst of great scenes of nature. He's going to speak to His people and He's going to invite His people to inherit the kingdom which was lost by Adam. 
In other words, God's people are going to go through the same experience that Job went through. They're going to suffer the same sufferings that he suffered. They're going to feel like God has forsaken them. But God will not have forsaken them. God will be as close as ever, even if they do not feel Him. Now, what can we learn from the story of Job? We can learn the fact that Job was faithful to God in these severe trials because he knew God from the prosperous times. In other words, he had a connection with God when things went well. Now these days we don't have persecution. We have many uh, material possessions. We have everything that the heart could desire. But are we developing that relationship with God in these times of prosperity? Because times of adversity are coming where we're going to lose every earthly support. Are we so connected with God that no matter if we lost everything, if we lost family, spouses, friends, if the whole world turned against God's people, if we lost all of our possessions, if we lost our health, if it appeared like we were going to lose our life, would our relationship with God be so strong that we would say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That is the kind of faith that we are going to have to develop in the end time. In fact, I'd like to end by reading a text that we find in Revelation chapter uh, 13. Revelation chapter 13. Here it says in verse uh, 9, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And then it says, Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Notice Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes, my friends, God's people will keep the faith. God's people like Job will be patient. And in the end, they will be victorious because they trust their life to the Lord.